Continuing education credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. Check out cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information. The Cribsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and informational purposes only. The views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host. Welcome back to the Cribsiders. Whoa. I always pause just in case anyone wants to share in the enthusiasm. Hopefully you in the car are sharing in the enthusiasm. I'm Justin Burt, joined tonight by Dr. Chris the Chew Man Chew and our incredible producer, Sydney Engel. How's it going, Sydney? Hey, doing well. What a great app. You you got an amazing uh, guest, an amazing script. Our guest tonight, Dr. Tanya Altman, here to discuss key parenting issues that are often discussed with pediatricians. And uh, there's not always training for that. So we're going to get you all set. Um, but before we dive into content, hey, Chris, can you remind us about the show? Sure. We're the Pediatric Medicine Podcast. We interview leading experts in the fields to bring you clinical pearls, practice changing knowledge, and answer lingering questions about core topics in pediatric medicine. We have a fantastic conversation with our guest, Dr. Tanya Altman. Dr. Altman is a UCLA-trained pediatrician, working mom, and nationally recognized child health expert. She is the author of several best-selling parenting books, including the American Academy of Pediatrics Baby and Toddler Basics, and is editor-in-chief of the AAP's Caring for Your Newborn and Young Child Birth to Age 5, and has also written the book Your Baby's First Year. With over 25 years' experience caring for children, Dr. Altman is sought after for her expertise in helping parents raise healthy, resilient kids with a desire to learn and succeed in school and life. In this episode, she teaches us how to help babies learn to self-soothe, how to encourage broccoli intake for the pickiest eater, and most importantly, how to create a poop partying potty training machine. Without further ado, let's get to it. We are so excited to have you, Dr. Tanya Altman, joining the show, teaching us how to parent. Uh, thanks for, for coming on to the Cribsiders. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to see what you throw at me. We're excited to have you. I think we have a lot to learn. Let's roll out. Um, I'll start by saying, you know, we're kind of an informal group. And so to be consistent, we often talk to our guests using their, their first name. Is it okay if we call you Tanya throughout the show? Sure, that's okay. You can call me anything you want. Okay, we can stick to Dr. Dr. Tanya, Dr. Altman. No, no, I was boss, kidding. We're... You can call me Tanya. Yeah. Honestly, my patients <laughs> right. call me all sorts of different things, and it doesn't really bother me. Like, I know a lot of physicians are all about that. I feel like I hear you. everybody we, in their own profession works hard for their own thing. You can call me anything. We appreciate it. We, we very much want to give all due respect to all of our wonderful guests. And like, you know, we're creating a vibe. We're doing the first name vibe. So that that's what we're going for. We, we appreciate all the guests coming on, sharing their time with us. And we're grateful to have you. And so for people who don't know you, could you maybe teach our listeners a little bit about who you are as a person and maybe tell us a, a fun fact or something about yourself outside of the field of medicine too? Sure. Let's see. Well, I am really old now. I've been practicing pediatrics for almost 25 years and I have three boys. I'm a book author. I've written about five books. I often do early morning news segments. Um, which is fun, but can also be exhausting. I also consult for child product companies and I have my own integrative pediatric concierge practice. So I have about 10 different jobs, but it's fun. I like keeping things different and I live in Southern California. Amazing. I feel like the morning show is like a peak of pediatric celebrity that I will just never achieve. It seems like your credibility is just through the roof right now, like beyond what what I can uh, uh, imagine, I think. So one question we love to ask our guests is, can you tell us about a favorite failure? Okay, let's see. So I think since we're all a medical crowd here, one of my favorite failures is that I actually failed my neuroanatomy final in med school. It was the first class I had, and I was a math major in college. So I learned, knew how to problem solve, but I didn't know how to memorize massive amounts of information. And I thought, oh, well, if I just looked at the brain and all the parts, I could just go into the final. And by the way, I went to med school back when we actually had cadavers and used real brains and you would walk around a room and have little toothpicks in the different areas of the brains. And I didn't realize how confusing it would be. And of course, my math mind couldn't figure that out and I actually failed. And so I had to come back to school early during the summer (laughs) and retake it and study all summer. And that's how I learned how to memorize massive amounts of information. So I always say that med school 
like ruined my mathematical brain, but I learned <laughs> a lot more. And so now I can memorize lots of information. I love that. I remember my first anatomy I think a lot test. of people would. Yeah. Similar. Yeah. Uh, a pain. <laughs> it's a pain and it's a humbling experience, but uh, uh, it's all about grit and growth mindset and memorizing. Yeah, yeah. Chris, what do we got? Well, how about another intro? I'm going to do a softball question because we brought it up at the beginning of the show and I thought this is a great question that we've never asked anyone. What's your favorite color and why? <laughs> Oh, well, my favorite color is pink because I have three boys. So I try to buy things that are a lot of pink so they don't steal my ski boots or my ski helmets. Um, sometimes oh. sparkly purple, but anything that looks really girly and fun because that's the only way I get that stuff in my house. Nice. Marking your stuff. I love it. Uh, I'm excited to dive into some content. This is an episode that I am very eager to do all about parenting. I should, you know, provide a disclosure that me and my wife feel like we are very much experts in this field. We have it all down. We don't actually have kids, but but we look at other people and feel like we, you know, <laughs> we've got it figured out. But I, I think that this is still going to be very helpful for for us and a lot of our listeners. And so maybe let's start with Chris has a comment. Hit it, hit it, Chris. What do you got? I was just going to say that you know. This is something that I would have loved to be able to talk about or listen to when I was an intern, because when I was an intern, I had not yet had children yet. And yet somehow when I walked into clinic, I had all these parents ask me questions. I was like, I don't know. I don't even know what a baby really looks like. Like a couple of times I saw when I was a med student and now all of a sudden I'm the expert in my pediatric clinic. And I was just so, I had no idea where I was going. So I, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about a couple of these because I think maybe I could still gain a couple of things to learn. You know, I have four boys right now. And, you know, I think the things that we're going to talk about, I still may be able to use. So four boys, you beat me. <laughs> wow. Congratulations, Chris. So I think that, you know, you're right. I mean, when I look back at some of the parenting advice I gave before I had kids, I'm like, what was I thinking? Even news segments. I watched my old Today Show news segments before I had kids. I'm like, I did not know anything that I was saying up there. So one of the things that I actually did when I first started practicing, and I highly recommend this to all young pediatricians, is I found a local family therapist, child development expert, and I offered to teach weekly groups with her for free to the community. And so every Wednesday night, parents would come in with their list of questions and they would ask about biting and hitting and potty training and nightmares and all the stuff that you don't learn in med school or residency. And I learned from her and she was this lovely British therapist with this beautiful accent. And I still remember how she said certain things and phrases. And that was really how I learned most of my parenting was doing that for a few years. I feel like that's a pro right there in terms of like an approach to learning this information, because, well, we can go over some of those things here, but we're not going to get to every single one of those. I mean, on the list of things you mentioned, I've had parents ask about every single one of those, and only one is on our script for today. So great, great thoughts. Uh, let's dive into a first case. <laughs> Hey listeners, if you haven't finished your holiday shopping yet, don't panic. There's still time to find incredible original gifts with the help of Uncommon Goods. UncommonGoods.com has the absolute best gifts for everyone in your life. We're talking moms, dads, teens, in-laws, besties, your one and only, and it's not stuff you can just find anywhere. Uncommon Goods has unique and creative gifts, often handmade by independent artists and makers. So skip the gifts that scream last minute and find something truly original at UncommonGoods.com. And if you want an experience instead, Uncommon Goods has you covered as well. Uncommon experiences are more than virtual classes. They're unexpected opportunities to have fun and connect in new ways from tarot card reading, lunar astrology charting, cooking mythology classes, crafts, gardening, and so much more. So Cribsetters listeners, to get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash Cribsetters. That's uncommongoods.com slash Cribsetters for 15% off. So don't miss out on the limited time offer. Uncommon Goods, we are all out of the ordinary. <laughs> Sydney, do you want to introduce us to our first patient? Absolutely. All right. So our first case, you are seeing four-month-old Xander at Cashlack Children's Primary Care for his well-child visit. He was born at term, is up to date with vaccines, has no significant past medical history, and is exclusively breastfeeding without issue. His growth is about 70th percentile for height and weight. When you ask about questions, his caregiver relates that she's concerned about sleep. Xander has never slept through the night and is now waking up crying every one to two hours. He also sometimes fights going down for a nap. He sleeps swaddled in a bassinet in the parents' room. 
His caregiver has been reading on many different Facebook groups about things like sleep training, wake windows, and sleep regressions, and would like your input. So recognizing that sleep can be a huge topic for parents, and there are lots of opinions out there, can you just give us a little bit of an overview in terms of what is known about infant sleep, and including how it changes over those first 12 months? Definitely. And I think this is another one of those things that you can't really understand, Justin, until you go through it yourself. Right, Chris? Right. Until yes, you get woken up every two hours by a crying baby that wants to feed. So, you know, most well, all babies initially, they have such small t- tummies. They need to feed every two hours through the night and they really can't learn to sleep through the night until they're somewhere between four and eight months, depending on the child. I mean, I usually like to say with my patients, I can get them sleeping through the night by four to six months, but it varies. They're not all going to be able to do that. And sleeping through the night does not mean 12 hours at night. I wish it did. It usually means six to eight hours. So I always start when I see patients by asking them, what is their goal? You know, because You can have all the best advice in the world, but if they're saying, I'm not going to let my child cry, or I really want them to sleep next to me in a co-sleeper, or whatever it is, it's going to change your advice. So I always say to parents, what is your goal? What is your dream scenario? Let's work together on how to get to that point. So let's say this family says, you know, we have... Xander sleeping in the same room as we do. And by the way, the AAP does recommend that infants sleep in their parents' room for the first year of life. It's one of the ways to help decrease and prevent SIDS. I'm telling you right now, babies sleep the night better when they're not in your room. And when I had my two older boys, that wasn't a recommendation. And I'm a super light sleeper. And after the first night, I was like, okay, I'm moving them out. I cannot sleep when they're laying next to me, making noise and wiggling and snoring all night long. So there are other ways that you can create a safe sleep environment. And if I have families that just really can't have their infants sleeping in their room at night, I respect that. Or by four to six months of age now, they're lifting their head up, they're stronger, the risk of SIDS really goes down. I might suggest that they think about moving the baby to his own room because that is actually going to help him sleep longer because every time he wiggles and makes noise and wakes up for a second, mom or dad aren't going to jump right in and say he's awake and feed him. And that's often what it takes is these really good routines and allowing your baby to start stretching their feeds out at night and sleep longer. So four month old, the first thing I'm going to ask is, is he putting himself to sleep? If they are rocking him to sleep, feeding him to sleep, soothing him to sleep, when he wakes up in the middle of night, he's going to need that parent to help soothe him back to sleep. So by three months of age, I usually recommend parents reverse or switch up their bedtime routine. And that means that feeding is no longer the last step. So of course, when they're a month or two old, you might nurse them, feed them to sleep, and that's okay. But by three to four months, you want feeding to be first, and then maybe you're going to bathe them and put them in their jammies and put them in their bassinet or crib and read them a book or sing them a song. And I like to have that as the last step before sleeping through the night. And they will get used to this, and they will know that that one book, Good Night Moon, whatever it is that you're reading them over and over again, is their signal to then relax, suck their thumb, their hand, shake their head, rub the sheet, whatever they do to soothe themselves to sleep, and they are going to go to sleep. And then when they wake up in the middle of the night later, they can use those same skills to self-soothe. But if you don't allow them to learn how to soothe themselves, they're always going to need you for that. So this doesn't mean you need to have them cry it out or anything like that. You can just help teach them how to self-soothe. So when they wake up in the middle of the night, you can give them a little bit of time and see if they can soothe themselves back to sleep. And that's sort of what I like to do to kind of stretch out those feeds and allow the kids to sleep at night. Can I do a quick quick follow-up to that? Because I think something that comes up a lot is this timing of how long you let them cry. So let's say we're doing a great job. You know, we're not feeding. We're we're doing a book. It's the same book. They get it. And then when they wake up at 1 a.m., do we let them cry for one minute, for five minutes? Do we do we let them self-soothe or do we immediately go in? I feel like this is something that they asked, you know, a lot of parents have different thresholds and how to kind of guide them for when to allow the kid to self-soothe. Is that really a skill that they're developing or just to go to kids? What, what do you recommend when parents ask that? 
Yeah, so it's going to depend on the age of the child, their size. So this is a four-month-old. He's a really well-girthed kid, right? It sounds like he's feeding well. He's chunky. He should be able to sleep probably four to six hours at night, but he's still waking up crying every one to two hours. So it sounds to me like this is a little more behavioral unless he has some reflux, some gas, other things going on too. So you want to make sure that, you know, he's going to the bathroom regularly. Constipation can keep kids up at night, right? So if he hasn't pooped for a few days, maybe he needs a little extra water, a little prune juice, some gas exercises. He needs that routine. But I don't mind letting them soothe a little bit. Now, this doesn't mean I'm saying cry it out, right? If I posted that on, you know, one of my Instagram videos, I would get all these hate comments from people saying, I can't let my child cry it out. You don't have to, but what you have to do is really allow them to self-soothe and learn how to do that. So I can't really answer your question of how long. It depends on your threshold. My second son, I do remember, we did do a cry it out, and I remember laying on the ground, half in his room, half outside, so he couldn't see us while I was looking at my watch while he cried. Now, he's 16 now, so this is a long time ago, and I didn't know as much back then, but I was told, let him cry it out. And it was really hard, and we did, and we let him cry for like, I think it was like six and a half minutes. And if you do the cry it out, what you will learn is that each time they wake up, it cuts itself in half, and after two nights, they are sleeping through the night. But not all parents can do that, not all parents wanna do that. But I did that, and in two nights, he was sleeping through the night. So it does work, but it has to be something that a parent wants to do. Are there any, just what to your point on the angry Instagrammers against cry it out, are there any known issues? I know that there's kind of some theories around attachment, et cetera, et cetera. From a clinical perspective, is there anything wrong with a parent that wants to try that? So when I taught the parenting workshops, as I mentioned, with this lovely British child development therapist, she used to say that in all my years of practice, and she was a lot older than I was, I have never had a teenager, an adult, come to me with their issues. And we realized that it was because their parents left them crying in their crib to learn how to fall asleep on their own. So I don't think it causes any long-term issues. That said, we don't want to be neglectful. And we do know that, you know, kids need their parents and they need to know that they're loved and supported and have all of their needs met. But I think you have all day long to do that with your kids. So I like to teach my kids that Nighttime is sleep time. And I have three boys and every babysitter I've ever had has said, wow, all I did was go in and read that book or say goodnight and your boys put their head down, we turned the light off and they went to sleep and we never heard from them again that night. I think that's the dream. It's just not hearing from your kids for extended periods of time. It seems like <laughs> at any age, I think that that's the pearl that applies. I um. I, I, from from my perspective, is not having kids right now. Um, this is great. So, I mean, I, I love this approach where it's really kind of meeting the parents where they're at, what their goals are. And it sounds like, you know, if a family comes in and says, we want to do the Ferber method or one of these like very specific sleep training systems, that's okay. And it's not going to cause any type of long-term uh, uh, harm and really just kind of being very kind of parent-centered. Is that a fair uh, assessment of kind of your approach? As long as baby is growing and developing normally and there's nothing else going on, then yes, I don't think you're going to cause any harm um, in whatever sleep method you decide to choose. Now, another tip I have is that I have an amazing lactation consultant, a newborn care educator who also does sleep training, who works with me in my office. So over the last eight years, she handles all of these cases now for me and all my babies sleep well through the night and I don't have to worry about these issues. You mentioned briefly earlier on about the AAP recommendation to keep the kid in the room recognizing that that doesn't necessarily work for all families. Can we just do a quick rundown of safe sleep recommendations? I feel like any sort of conversation about sleep would be remiss to not touch on that. Definitely. And thank you for reminding that. So absolutely every baby does need to be in a safe sleep environment. So that means on their back in a bare crib or co-sleeper or bassinet. So you don't want any loose blankets, stuffed animals, anything like that, that a baby could accidentally get over their face or any sort of wedge where they could accidentally flip over and end up with their face trapped somewhere where it's hard for them to breathe. 
Now that said, things that you can do, or you can have your baby wear a sleep sack, a wearable blanket when it's cold. I love those. Often I transition my babies from a pacifier to a little blankie around four to six months of age. That way they don't get stuck on the pacifier. And one of the things I do is I take the little square blankie and I knot it in the middle. So that way it's safe and it's not gonna end up over their face or be a suffocation risk and they can just suck on the edge of it. And the dentists love that because it doesn't affect their teeth. Awesome. One more question about nighttime sleep. So in this case, there was this change in Xander's sleep where he had been sleeping for longer stretches and then went to waking up every one to two hours. And there are certainly in some context an idea of sleep regressions that there is a child goes through a some sort of transition and then is no longer able to sleep like they were. Do parents ask you about that? What advice do you give? Do all kids go through this? That sort of thing. So I do feel that sleep regression is a thing. That said, I would also want to make sure that he's not sick. There's no ear infection. He's not constipated, which also is very common around this age, as that can also affect nighttime sleep and be a much quicker fix often. And then if that's the case and we do feel that everything else is going normally, then it may be a case of sleep regression, in which case I would probably work on just reinforcing the nighttime routine, making sure he's self-soothing to sleep and help give the parents the support they need to allow him when he wakes up to self-soothe as long as they're okay with it so he can get back to sleep and kind of restretch out those nighttime feeds. I love the central theme of really the, the self-soothing is still and kind of working on those and making sure we're not missing anything else, but but focusing on that. One of the questions I have too for, for more daytime sleep is one of my favorite activities is napping. I love napping as an adult, as a child, have always been uh, something I'm just glad we do. For kids, it seems like it's a little more confusing of how many naps should we be doing? How long should the nap be? What time is nap time? When do we drop the nap as part of normal development? Can you give us the, the insight, the expert insight on on child napping? Well, I'm glad that you are a good napper, Justin, because I am not a good napper and I cannot nap unless it's dark and cold and I'm laying in a flat bed. So I wish I could be one of those people that could just nap on in an airplane chair. So naps are very important and kids do get a little kids, babies get a lot of their quality sleep when they're napping. So initially I find that babies get into a good nap routine right around four months of age. So around Xander's age in this case scenario. And probably at this age, he's napping three times a day. Then around six months of age, once they're starting solids, and it's not necessarily related to the fact that they're eating more of a developmental progression. That's when I find that kids go to two naps a day and they're really sleeping for a good chunk at night, like eight hours waking up for one feed and then going back to sleep. So they're getting that full 11 hours at night. When do they drop from two to one nap? Anywhere between one and two years of age. And it really depends on the child and the parent's routine. So your first kid is going to have a great really secure nap schedule, right? Then your second child is gonna get woken up and put in the car to go pick up that first child from preschool and their naps are gonna be all over the place and they're gonna be sleeping in that car seat and that's just part of life and what happens. But often I find that, you know, as they get between 18 months and two years of age, you'll find that they're staying up later at night and that afternoon nap is getting pushed a little later. And that's when I often talk to parents about trying to drop that second nap. And, um, and it might depend on if it's a school day, if it's a weekend, when they wake up in the morning, but that's a transition that's going to happen. And then they're going to drop their naps completely altogether, sometime usually between age two and three, but some kids will keep that nap through kindergarten. There's a lot of kindergartners that still nap after school. My boys didn't, I don't know who's does, but some still do and some still need that. But if that is making them stay up late at night where they're not going to bed till nine or 10 or 11 because they're taking that long afternoon nap, then it's probably time to pull back on it. And it can take months where there are some days napping, some days they're not, and that's okay. Love that. So I love titrating to kind of the nighttime, the bedtime uh, uh, routine and that they're sleeping okay. I love your um, use of the phrase titrating to describe naps. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah, clearly apparent over here. 
I um, <laughs> I think this is, has been a very good kind of overview of sleep. Any before we move on to our next case, any other pearls from Dr. Allman or other questions that we have before before moving on? So one of the things I learned with my first son was that any routine that you have and anything that you use in that routine, whether it's a sound machine or this was back when you were allowed to attach those cute aquariums to the crib <laughs> and we would push the button and the fish would swim and sing and bubbles would come up as he would fall asleep sucking on his blankie and we were reading Goodnight Moon. If you go on vacation, you have to take all that stuff with you. <laughs> Don't forget, right? So we didn't bring the aquarium on our first trip to New York and he did not sleep. So now, now with sound machines and telephone, cell phones with apps on them, which I didn't have back then, it makes it a little easier. But anything that is part of your child's routine, you have to be able to take with you to the grandparent's house, on vacation, or anywhere that you go. And if it's a blankie or a levy, buy lots of extras because I have turned around an hour and a half to my parents' house because I forgot to bring the blankie and I had to go home and get it. That was one of the very first things that we did is uh, when we bought a blankie, we bought five of them and we just routinely switched them out. So they were just as well used, but they felt the same and they smelled the same. And, and so it was just, then you could actually clean them and cycle them through. So, you know, we did the blankie. Exactly. And, and I love the blankies idea. because kids can be in kindergarten and still sleep with their blankie next to them. And it's a totally fine and safe and healthy security item that won't affect their teeth. I love it. Let's uh, let's keep moving. Let's let's go on to, to case number two. Sydney, you want to tell us about our next patient? Absolutely. Okay. So case number two. Next on your schedule is five-year-old Felicia, who is here for a chief complaint of quote unquote not eating. Her caregiver explains that she has always been a somewhat picky eater, but in the last few months has become incredibly selective with what she eats, refusing most of what is cooked for dinner. According to her caregiver, she will eat rice, pizza, and cookies, and not much else. She eats lunch at school and says she likes the pizza and chicken nuggets. The caregiver confirms that she doesn't like vegetables or many fruits. Her caregiver is concerned that she may have a parasite and also worried that she's not getting the nutrition that she needs. On exam, she's well appearing, no abdominal tenderness or masses, no signs of dehydration. Her weight is 65th percentile and height is 50th percentile. So to start off, how common is picky eating? And are there certain ages or changes in life where it is most likely to present? So picky eating is very common. And I find that I hear a lot about picky eating around age two, and then again around age five, just as this case that you presented. So I think, I think that does happen. Now, Often with our first child, we are able to control the environment so much better, right? I remember with my first, I'm not giving him any sugar. He's only eating vegetables and salmon and super healthy foods. And I do believe that that's why he grew up to be such a healthy eater. My second child got pulled around to all the birthday parties, got exposed to pizza, chicken nuggets, all of those things. And I actually, um, I wrote a book on this and I really do believe that exposing kids to some of these artificial processed, not real foods early on does sort of change the way that their brain perceives what food should taste like. So if a chicken nugget is the first food item that your child ever has in terms of chicken, they're gonna think that's what chicken tastes like. So you, want, you do wanna try to keep them away from artificial processed kid-like food as long as possible. It's not a reality to keep it away from them forever, but I would say as long as possible. And if you grew up with having kids eat what you're eating and expose them to a variety of healthy things, fruits, vegetables, spices, flavors, most of them will continue to eat healthy. And then when they go through these phases where they become picky, they it's just a phase, but they will get back to their roots of what they were used to eating. Whereas the kids that are raised on the fast food, not being exposed to that healthy food, which I know is not always a choice, right? Some families, that's just unfortunately what, what they have to offer. It is much harder than to correct it when they're five like this. So Fernando's growing well. That's the first thing I look at, right? So I'm not really concerned that there's, you know, a medical issue going on here because he's a little above average for weight, his height's average. Um, you know what I would ask this caregiver? I actually want to know what everyone else in the house is eating first. I don't want to know what he's eating. I want to know what everyone else in the house is eating and what he's being exposed to. 
because if this is what everybody else in the house is eating, the rice, pizza, and cookies, how can they expect him to eat other things? And where is he getting those things from then? So sometimes you have to kind of go back to the basics and start taking the kids to the farmer's market, getting them in the kitchen, taking them to the grocery store, letting them pick out a new fruit or vegetable, try it out. Now, again, we don't want to force them. So it really depends on the child and what he's eating. So let's say the only thing he eats right now are rice, pizza, and cookies, period. I might start working with that then and say, okay, let's start slowly changing the pizza. Let's get a healthier crust, let's get a healthier sauce, let's hide some vegetables in there, because vegetables are still vegetables, whether they're hidden or not, right? They're still getting the good nutrition. And then I do like to really take a look though at their overall diet. And if my patients are not getting enough nutrition in their diet, I will use some supplements. And um, it's interesting because I feel like multivitamins and sometimes vitamins can be controversial. So let me just tell you that during the COVID pandemic, we actually started seeing cases of scurvy again in kids. Now some were, many were developmentally delayed kids that were literally just eating like French toast every day. I had a case, it wasn't my personal patient. I was called in on a local consult because I tend to get called for some of the tougher cases. And it was a developmentally delayed child who was really just eating bread and eggs. That was all he ate all through the pandemic and presented with bleeding gums and a limp and it ended up being scurvy. After that, I will never tell anyone not to give a multivitamin to their kids if they want it, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I do feel like there can be a benefit in a multivitamin if your kids aren't eating a well-balanced diet. I also find sometimes that when I take these picky eating kids and I start supplementing them with omegas, and some of the um, nutrients that are in fruits and vegetables, they actually start then craving those items and they will start branching out and eating a wider variety of food. Now, I don't think that's research driven, right? So I don't want to, you know, I'm sure some people are like, what? Where's the data on that? I'm just telling you what I see in my practice. And I'm very big on nutrition. I'm very big on supplements if needed. But I really think that if kids don't have proper nutrition, they cannot focus and concentrate in school. They will not grow properly and develop properly. And so I do think that every child needs certain nutrients that are in fruits and vegetables and salmon and dairy products, however we get it in their diet. So I love this and I love the idea of really kind of having that exposure to create the brain networks, you know, the neural connections. This is what food's supposed to taste like and, and healthy food. And I think this is great nutritional advice from day one. For the patients, you know, it sounds like one thing you mentioned is trying to create like a, a healthy pizza, healthier crust or adding vegetables. I love that pearl. Talking about using some supplements to maybe create some kind of craving for, for the omegas. Are there any other strategies as far as, I feel like things people think about is, you know, still trying to get them to eat the healthy food first or, you know, saying that they have to clean their plate or, you know, cooking them something else that's not being cooked. How do you, you know, now that we have a patient in front of us that is unfortunately in a phase or did not get to benefit from your outstanding nutrition counseling early on, are there things we can do to kind of help encourage developing these healthy eating habits later on? Yes. Okay. So I always say there's three things you cannot force a child to do. You cannot force them to eat. You cannot force them to sleep and you cannot force them to poop in the potty. Right? <laughs> so Therefore, we do have to work within the guidelines of what he will eat here. So I would say, I want to know what is he exposed to? Like, is there a way they can go to the grocery store together, help him pick out fruits and vegetables, even if he's not going to eat them? Maybe he can help prepare a vegetable lasagna for a parent and call it Fernando's lasagna. And he can draw a menu and he can talk to everybody in the household about all the vegetables he put in and get him excited about those vegetables. And he might not want to eat it yet, but if he's helping prepare and and make it for a few weeks in the kitchen and then maybe he sees it on the table and then maybe it sits on his plate and then maybe he kisses the broccoli I mean there are all sorts of these like slow you know process we can do for kids that are really anti vegetables to get them to kind of get back to them you can also make it fun you can have them dip vegetables I mean there's all these different things we can do but it's really gonna be specific to what he's willing to do there's some kids that won't even touch the vegetables, right? So, so you might have to start then with just 
playing with them and touching them. There's others that will cook them and present them to the parents, um, but they won't eat them. But as long as you keep exposing them to the fruits and the vegetables and those healthy items, I find they will get back to it, even when they're older. And let me tell you that my mom will say that I was the pickiest child in the world. And my parents were total health freaks. Like I grew up with sprouts growing on the counters, nothing processed. And I refused to eat any of that stuff. And we lived abroad when I was in elementary school because my dad was a professor on sabbatical. And I refused to eat so much that my grandparents had to send over boxed mac and cheese. Yeah. Like, why would I eat that, right? Like looking back now, that's so bad. But as they will tell you, as I got into middle school, because I grew up with that healthy foundation, I went back to eating really healthy. And out of all my siblings, I'm actually the healthiest eater now. So I do think that how you raise kids, even if they go through phases of being picky where they only want boxed mac and cheese, they are gonna get back to their roots as long as you have it there provided for them and you don't take it away. What I do see happen sometimes is a mistake. And this is what I always tell parents. If your child does not like vegetables, so you stop making them and you stop showing them vegetables, they're never gonna go back to liking them, right? So when I have families come in and say, my child doesn't like vegetables, so, so I don't bother buying and making them. Okay, well, they're, they're never gonna go back to liking vegetables then. So you have to still buy and make them and present them those vegetables in different forms, and they will eventually go back to eating them, I promise. So it sounds like really, as pediatricians, we don't need to be in telling parents like, your child must eat this broccoli. Instead, it should be making it continually part of the way that meals are presented and the experience of food so that the child eventually approaches it on their own, which I think is a really interesting pearl. Kind of on the flip side of that, when a kid does enter a picky phase, do you buy them the boxed mac and cheese and just say, okay, every day I'm going to give you a plate of your of our food and if you don't want it, we'll make you the boxed mac and cheese? Or is there some sort of negotiation that goes on? Or do you say you need to eat some of this? Like, How, how do you recommend parents approach that? So I think there are there are different ways you can approach it, and um, I think there are also healthier versions of boxed mac and cheese that we could that we could choose. I do think that there has to be some sort of item that you and your child kind of agree on that is you know not totally junk food, but maybe not the healthiest thing that you would like. That's okay for them to eat. For example, they don't want anything that you're making. Okay, so can they have a healthy peanut butter sandwich? I think that's fine. I think peanut butter, almond butter on whole wheat bread, that's a good backup, right? Or maybe they want a bowl of healthy cereal or a scrambled egg or something like that, you know, because they're not gonna eat the fancy salmon dish that you made. I think it's fine to have one other backup option or you can get them involved in the making it. Like, okay, mom's making salmon tonight. I know you guys aren't huge salmon fans, is there something else that you know you think we could make that could go with it? Or will you at least taste it and then you can have you know the chicken that I'm making on the side? So I think bringing them into the conversation and the discussion you know, is always a good idea. But as long as you keep having the conversation and have the different items there, as they get older, they will get curious and they will start to taste it. I wrote my What to Feed Your Baby book with a dietitian, and I remember she had the pickiest girls. And I think she said it took her a whole year of making fruit and vegetable smoothies with her daughter. Her daughter was help making them before she agreed to taste it. But she stuck out and kept making it with her daughter until her daughter finally started tasting and drinking them. I will say from first from some personal uh, uh, experience, my grandmother used to tell me that the broccoli was crying if I didn't eat it. And that's a great way to just have overwhelming <laughs> guilt throughout your adult life. Uh, I think that that was a good strategy, if that's helpful to any of the listeners out there, too. I think you that. know, I haven't tried the crying broccoli. I always say broccoli's like, you know, little trees. Don't you want to eat little trees? Um, one of the other things when you have toddlers, by the way, I think is really fun. And this you reminded me of it with your grandmother is if they don't want to eat the fruits and vegetables, you just eat it off of their tray and you're like, yum, and you start to eat it. And they'll be like, why? Why is mom? or big brother, big sister eating it, and then they'll want to eat it. Mm. The other thing is getting your kids to go to a friend's house and eat something healthy at their friend's house because things are always taste better at a friend's house, right? Mm. So I remember my middle son was anemic and he refused to eat meat. And then he went to a friend's house and the mom had them make these fun tacos and he ate one and he liked it. And so then we would make Beth's tacos, you know, twice a week because I had to get the meat in him. And same with other kids would come to my house and the parents would say they won't eat any vegetables. I'm like, 
give me a few days with them. I will get them trying vegetables. And I would have them in the garden and I would have them, you know, helping pick the kale from the tower garden I had in the backyard, which by the way, only lasted me a few years. And then my kids were like, we're done with that mom. Mm -hmm. um, but it's always good to try new things and experiment and you'll see what works for you and your family. Love it. You know, the sort of reminds me of this might be another good reason to continue to encourage uh, families to eat the table together because you're, you're constantly showing a good example of like, these are the foods we eat. Mom and dad like to eat this food or your other caregivers, your brothers, your sisters, like everyone likes to eat this or may like to eat this. And this is, this is good food. Exactly, Chris. And I think that's a really important point. Family meals are so important. Our lives are so chaotic nowadays and kids are all in different activities and parents are working. And sometimes you can't eat a family dinner every single night, but you want to pick a handful of meals a week. And for my family, we always have weekend brunch together where we all cook and we sit down and we talk and we eat brunch together because we, we just can't eat dinner every night together. Or what I used to do when my kids were little is they would eat before my husband got home. But then when my husband came home to eat, they would eat fruit so we could still sit at the table and talk to him and have like a quote family dinner but they they ate at five and he got home at 7 30 because he was an attorney and so that's what we would sort of do to kind of continue the talking and tradition and still have something you know for them to have at night and share with their dad now to go back to the case you know so we have a caregiver who's concerned that you know the child has a parasite like is this something that you know clinicians should also be concerned about like are there other underlying medical issues that we as pediatricians need to be concerned about when you know we have someone with picky eating or is it just so common that really most kids are just being picky eaters as as part of their development so you know there could be something else going on i had a five-year-old present with ulcerative colitis recently and they kept coming in saying that their tummy hurt and they didn't want to eat. And that was really their complaint. So I think it's important to rule out more serious medical issues. So is there any pain going on? Are there any loose or unusual stools going on? Or anything else that might be a sign of a parasite or an underlying medical issue? So I assume that's sort of all been kind of ruled out here. But once in a while, if you have a family that is just, let's say, so preoccupied with, could their child have a parasite? Parasite, you can send a stools test to the lab. I mean, sometimes we do have to do tests to just decrease anxiety in parents. So if this parent was coming back week after week saying, I think my child has a parasite, I would say, great, let's check for that parasite. Okay, ruled out. That's no longer going on. Now let's sit down and address, you know, what, what is going on. And maybe um, we have to work on how you're all doing mealtime in your house and feeding and, and all of that. Maybe one more in talking about kind of uh, stimulating appetite and appetite for people who are picky eating and just are saying that they're not hungry. In, in cases of things like cystic fibrosis or developmental delay, I feel like ciproheptadine is a little bit of a more accepted form of pharmacotherapy to, to stimulate appetite. Is this something that you're ever considering in a child who is reportedly just a picky eater but does seem to be losing weight or does seem to start having concerns that the picky eating is having challenges to his growth? So it's a great question. You know, um, I feel like um, cyproheptadine isn't used as much recently. That said, I do have a patient with CF on it. I do have a patient on ADHD and other mental health medications that is on it. And, you know, in conjunction with the psychiatrist, we did start it and it did really help. I find in most otherwise healthy kids that don't have any underlying medical conditions that aren't on other medications that can affect appetite. I usually would prefer to use actual real food and we might just make that food more caloric dense for them. So like adding more olive oils, adding more nut butters, adding more, you know, healthy high calorie foods. Maybe the child needs more exercise. You know, maybe they are really bored. Maybe there is some underlying depression or sadness going on. So I think I think there are a lot of things you can sort of take a look at to 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 rule out and see what's going on here. I actually had a teenager the other day who came in. Her chief complaint was, I have no appetite. I'm not eating. I'm losing weight. My friends are worried about me and I swear I don't have an eating disorder. She actually was being treated for depression by a psychiatrist and she was on a pretty high dose of an antidepressant and I truly feel that that's what was affecting her appetite. So I am working with the psychiatrist now on lowering the medication, working on some mood supplements. I'm having her drink some um, high calorie nutrition beverages regularly. And you know, that's sort of the direction that we are going with her. Now, again, that's a very unusual specific case. 
But I think each case, you know, can sometimes be unique and you may need to pull some little tricks out of a hat to see. One of the high calorie snacks that I do like for my patients who are swimmers or exercise a lot are actually nut butter filled pretzels. I try to get my patients off of like artificial bars and protein bars and things that aren't real food. So instead I'll use a lot of nut butters, I'll use a lot of avocado, I'll use a lot of oils, you know, things like that. So I found that a local health market has these nut butter stuffed pretzels that I think are really healthy and caloric dense. And I think that is a great snack for my athletes to eat after school before they go exercise. I love it. I was about to jump on and say the the nut butter filled Cliff Bars are delicious, but then I realized that's probably one of the processed foods that doesn't count. So we'll just say that I'm eating the the pretzels instead. <laughs> the, the nut butter and are delicious. everything you know within reason, right? So it doesn't mean you can never have those. And I do think those bars are very convenient. But I find that when kids are eating them every day, um, I, that's when I see a lot of constipation. I see a lot of headaches. I see a lot of other issues because it's not real food and your body wasn't really meant to process it as it does regular food. I've been on this anti-paleo diet recently where I only eat things that wasn't available during the Paleolithic area. And so uh, it, it hasn't been going well. Um, this was a great overview of, of picky eating, a very common presentation, I feel like, in pediatrics. Any other questions or pearls on picky eating before we move to the next case? I think smoothies are a great way to get things into your child's diet, especially when it comes to sticking other things that they need to eat for nutrition wise in, whether it's like, you know, spinach or kale or broccoli sprouts, depending on what we want their brain to have, um, fruits, veggies, nut butters, supplements. You can hide some supplements in smoothies as well. That said, I don't have a lot of time to make smoothies at my house. So. <laughs> So I'm lucky if I can get a couple in a week for my kids, but it is always something that, you know, can be beneficial. I think one cookbook my, my wife really liked using for our kids is uh, Jerry Seinfeld's wife, Jessica Seinfeld. She, she wrote a book called Deceptively Delicious. And I think she hides, she's able to cook foods that hides all sorts of different foods in there. My wife does this all the time. She's making some sort of pasta. She's like, Let's make it green. And then she'll put like a bunch of veggies in there and the kids really like it. But I guess I, I didn't mean to make a recommendation there, but there's a recommendation. I think that's a great idea. And you know, there's those two schools of thought, right? I mean, do they, what if you always puree the broccoli and put it into what they're eating? Will they never know what real broccoli looks like and how to eat it properly? I think all forms of nutrition are good. And I think the broccoli doesn't lose nutrition by pureeing and putting it in the brownies, right? But you also do wanna show your kids what real vegetables look like as well. So I think there's a mix of all of it is good, but I am all for hiding nutrition in. I feel like every food you eat should be nutrient rich, even snack foods. I like to get nutrition into snacks too. So instead of buying packaged snack foods, use real foods. Give your child a banana, a nut butter sandwich, you know, whatever it is, leftover lunch, dinner. Like let's take any opportunity that our child wants to eat to get that nutrition in that they need for proper growth and development. Love that. I think that's a, a great pearl to end on for, for case number two. And we move on metaphorically and somewhat physically to our case number three. Uh, Sydney, what do we got? All right. You see so that segue, Chris? I love it. Um, our last case. As you're wrapping up for the day, one of your trainees comes up to present to you about a three-year-old well visit. She explains that the parents are concerned because their son is still not potty trained and the preschool is requiring that he be potty trained in order to enter. They bought a small toilet and encouraged him to sit on it, but he rarely does so and says he's afraid to use the toilet. Lately, his stool has been harder and the trainee worries that he may be stool withholding. Otherwise, he's growing well, no vomiting or abdominal distension, and eats fairly well. So obviously, when we're talking about potty training, there are a lot of different aspects, and stooling versus urinating is a little bit of a different process. But just generally, what guidance do you give families about potty training readiness and how to start that process? Definitely. So I feel like potty training or being toilet trained is a developmental milestone. So like riding a bike or learning to walk, you can't force it, right? They have to be developmentally ready, they have to understand it, and they have to at least a little bit wanna do it. <laughs> so if you start the process earlier, 
Then I usually recommend to all my families, like at the two-year checkup, that they keep the child's stools really soft because we know that the one thing that's going to derail potty training is these hard stools like this is happening here. So we can talk about in a minute what to do once it's already there. But if early on they can keep the stools really soft, they can encourage the kids, they can make it exciting, fun, yay, let's call grandma and tell her that you peed in the potty and do the potty dance, you know, and all that fun, silly stuff. That all does really work. But then sometimes you end up with an older child, a three or four year old, and they're refusing to go and they have hard stools and they know what's going on, but they don't want to go in the potty. So what do you do then? And that's what I'm going to say. This is more behavioral and not as much developmental. And so what I would probably say to this mom, and I hate that she has the deadlines. Whenever you have a deadline of school starting or something big like that, it's not going to happen, right? That's going to derail you. So I'm going to say, listen, you might not be able to start school on that date. And that's something you're just going to have to understand and deal with. But we can get your child using the potty in a week if you stay home for the week and you don't go anywhere because it's really confusing to kids if they're sometimes going to the potty and then you put a pull up and then you're going to this person's house and you're doing this and they will hold onto the stool and they will only poop when you put the pull up on in the car or at night. So you really gotta devote a whole week to it once it becomes this behavioral issue after age three. So I would say we're gonna make those stools really soft so we can do it with prunes, we can do it with dietary changes, we can do it with fluids or guess what? You might have to use a stool softener for a week or two. And that's okay, it's not gonna be long-term. It doesn't sound like this child is that backed up and that impacted. We are going to stay home. When they wake up in the morning, we're gonna say, guess what? The store was out of diapers, you're three now. We are gonna start party training. And you are going to make an area near the bathroom where you are going to play and entertain and occupy your child all day long. And if you can, if the weather permits it, let's leave them naked and let's follow them around. And if there's another caregiver, you're gonna take turns because no one's gonna leave this child alone, right? Because at that moment, when you see that they are starting to like wiggle or squirm or hold on to anything, you're gonna encourage them to get over to that potty or that toilet. And then when they go, you're gonna make a big deal out of it and praise. And if they have an accident, oops, no big deal. We'll clean up, we'll try again tomorrow. And I bet you that if you do this, Day one or two, you might have a few accidents. Day three or four, you probably won't have any. And by day five or six, they are going to be using the potty just fine. This sounds easy. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I don't totally. know why parents are having such a fuss over this. This sounds great. <laughs> well, you have to take yeah. the whole week off yeah. work, though, Justin, to yeah, get it to happen, tough. right? Yeah. The best vacation. <laughs> yeah, sounds awesome. <laughs> my husband grew out his beard when each of my boys potty trained for the week over winter break. I said, because my boys were three. I was busy. I was working. I didn't have time to do it earlier, right? All of a sudden, they were three. Oh, my goodness. Just like this mom here, they need to be potty trained. So I said, we are not going on vacation winter break. We are staying home. We are doing this. And we did the same thing with each three of them. I have silly pictures of them sitting on the potty with that face like, I'm never going to poop in the potty, mom, ever in my entire life. And I show it to them now that they're teenagers, <laughs> right? And they get so embarrassed. Um, but they will. No one's going to, you know, go to college right. in a diaper. I mean, if they're otherwise yeah. developmentally healthy and appropriate. So you can do it. And I think it really just depends on the age and the stage and what's going on with your child. But I, this is one of the reasons why I start prunes at six months of age. It's one of my foundation foods that I recommend all kids eat. I think if you raise a child to like prunes, it's going to make your life so much easier when they come home from school with a tummy ache, when you go to an amusement park and they get constipated, you just give them prunes, a lot of fluids, get them right back on track with their going to the bathroom. I think prunes are one of the healthiest foods that everybody should grow up eating. Wow, we got a, a tip for our picky eating in our potty training case. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. And it helps with sleep. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of. Maybe. Huh, I don't know about that, Justin. Let's see. Well, okay, yes. If you poop before bedtime, you will be more comfortable and you will sleep it longer. All comes it's back to prunes. true. I always get those phone calls about those six-month-olds. They were, they were sleeping great, and now they've been fussy for a few nights not sleeping. When did they go to the bathroom last? Oh, it's been four or five days. Why don't you give them some baby food prunes and an extra cup of water? Clean them out. Oh, they're back to sleeping well. So there you go, it's Justin. We tied it all together. All connected. It is. I um, very rarely have any recommendations to make with regards to parenting, but one of my 
friends, her daughter was refusing to stool in the toilet. This you were mentioning about different incentives. And I thought of this was refusing to stool in the toilet. And what got her to do it was that her pediatrician wrote and sent in the mail a letter when she finally went in the toilet. And that was like the incentive that she needed, that she would get a letter from her pediatrician. So it's a power. It's something we can do. It is. And I do. I will talk to the kids in the office and I'll say, you know what? You are three now. You are a big kid. And guess what happens when mommy and daddy poop in the potty? They get to flush and their poops go to a poop party under the house. And don't you want your poops to go to a poop party under the house with your parents' poops? And then we dance around the room. And then I say, okay, so you're going to go home and you are going to poop in the potty and your mom is going to call me and we are going to have a dance party over the phone when you poop in the potty and get them all excited about it. My grandmother would just say the poop is crying if you don't get it into the <laughs> I need to meet your grandma, Justin. Yeah, she it's sounds too amazing. late for that, but she she was she was a wonderful woman. She was she was a good one. Uh-huh. Not to change chubs that from poop or my grandmother, but moving over to bedwetting, you know, going from number two to number one. What about bedwetting? How about, you know, if a family member is coming in and saying, let's say, you know, that their three or four year old is still wetting the bed and they're really concerned about this. Um, what are your thoughts on on kind of counseling a parent about bedwetting and potty training for, for urination? And, and what can families kind of expect of when their kids should be staying dry overnight and what to do if, if not? So when we talk about toilet training or potty training, we're usually referring to daytime toilet training. So nighttime is a little bit different. And I find that about half of the kids, when they become potty trained at age two or three, within a few months will be dry at night. And then the rest, it's gonna take a lot longer. Will that be months? Will that be years? It really varies. And it's not something that you can really rush or force. Now, sometimes you have those kids where they're just still wetting the bed into elementary school. And usually in those cases, there's a parent that still that wet the bed at the same age. And so that can be hereditary. Things you can do to help are you can, you know, make sure they're not constipated because then that can press on the bladder and also cause some more wetting. You can also try to decrease fluids at night, maybe give more fluids in the morning. I find that a lot of parents complain that their kids wet more during the summer because they're running around, it's really hot out, they're not drinking enough, and during the summer they just down those fluids at night because they're so thirsty. So during the summer, I say push the fluids in the morning and not as much at night. The other thing I like to do is as kids are potty trained and they're starting to learn how to be dry at night is to role play how to get up and use the potty in the middle of the night because it can be scary for a three-year-old or a four-year-old in a dark room to get up and walk to the bathroom. So what I do is I make sure there's a clear path. They're not going to get hurt. There's a light on so they know where the bathroom is. And I'll say, okay, so as we're getting ready for bed now, we are going to pretend to get up in the middle of the night and use the potty. So I want you to lay down and close your eyes and pretend you're asleep. Okay, it's the middle of the night and you have that feeling. What are you going to do now? Okay, you're going to wake up and you're going to get out of bed and you're going to go pee in the potty. And then in my house, my rules, my boys were young, were in the middle of the night, you do not need to wash your hands or flush, right? You just need to get it in the potty and then you can go back to sleep. We'll deal with the flushing and hand washing in the morning. (laughs) Everybody might not feel the same way I do, but that's usually what I do. And so we role play and we practice before bedtime and then we go, yay! And then they, in the middle of the night... I always say like, if I see pee in the potty in the morning, we're gonna have a big party. I'm gonna be so proud of you, yay. The other thing is that diapers and pull-ups are so absorbent now. So it doesn't really give kids that incentive anymore because they're like worried they're gonna pee all over themselves in the bed, right? And as a busy mom, I didn't wanna get rid of that pull-up and have to change the bed in the middle of the night. So I left it on longer and that probably took a little longer for my boys to be dry at night. But it is also nice because that's something you can do and you can keep reusing them. So I usually tell parents, don't pull the pull up until they're really dry every night. Whereas years ago, we used to say, once they're dry half the night, get rid of the nighttime diaper and they'll wet a little bit and learn how to get up at night. Yes, that's true. But, you know, if you're a busy doctor, nurse practitioner, you don't have time for that. So, yeah, you can leave it on a little longer at night and that's okay. Just encourage and praise your kids and they will get it. Um. What about bedwetting alarms? Is that something that you recommend to parents? Do they work? So I think they do work. I really, I haven't had to recommend or use them in a long time. 
I feel like they do help though. If that's, if you have an older child that is still wetting the bed in older elementary school and that's something that you want to try, I think it's fine to try. Um, I also sometimes have parents, you know, let's say the child goes to bed at eight or nine and then the parents don't go to bed till 10 or 11. I'll say, why don't you wake your child up and walk them to the bathroom to empty their bladder and then put them back to sleep. It's usually those really heavy sleeping kids that just don't wake up in the middle of the night. So it's a blessing and a curse, right? The kids that sleep heavily through the night and nothing wakes them up. It's amazing. You want that. But then they also often don't wake up when they need to go to the bathroom. So I think bedwetting alarms can be a good behavioral training strategy. That said, I don't really use them very often. I feel like it's very reassuring. I feel like that was always the answer to the test question. Like that was the right answer on, on like the prep and the boards. And I've maybe done it once and that was by patient preference. And I think it was hard to figure out how to order. So I feel like that's not something that's prevalent in our practice at all. So again, very reassuring that our practice is aligning with the experts, which is always very reassuring. And one of the major reasons we do this show. This is great. You know, I think we've gotten to cover a lot of very core topics that as pediatricians, we don't always feel overly prepared for, but get asked a lot from parents who are concerned about either sleeping or eating or, or peeing and pooping. And I think this really kind of comes into, you know, trying to support parents and meet them where they're at. In all the, the things that we've talked about, what do you think are some of the main take home points for, for our listeners and trainees? What are some things that you want to make sure everyone walks away from this podcast episode with? I think one of the things um, that's important to know is that it's really important to be flexible, right? So nothing changes on the day you're one versus the day after where you have to get rid of the pacifier. You have to get rid of the, the bottle. You have to have your kids sleeping through the night. Like it's all a developmental progression. And the older I've gotten in pediatrics, I feel like the more flexible I am with families. Because if it's not going to be a detriment medically, it's okay if it takes a little longer. So I think being flexible, but moving in the right direction with the goal of health and wellness, you know, is ultimately the most important thing. I love it. Beautiful, beautiful takeaways. Also, we always like to ask anything that you'd like to plug. Tell us about these books, you know, what's going on? What should our listeners check out after, after listening to this show? Okay, well, you said no name brands, and then you mentioned Cliff Bars. Well, so we're, like, we're formally sponsored by Cliff no. Bars. They they pay for 20 No, <laughs> not at all, not no, at no, all. No, but if not. they're listening. Uh, <laughs> I do actually think they're, they are a good company, and when I said no, you know, protein bars, if you're choosing Great. one, I think those are a – they also make the yeah. same bars for kids, too. You know, Cripsiders which, which endorse. Just not, it's not an everyday food, you know? Okay, so – um. <laughs> So you can follow me on social media at Dr. Tanya Altman. I have several American Academy of Pediatrics books, Baby and Toddler Basics, which is the expert. I don't know why I'm showing you because we're not here right now, right? Expert answers to parents' top 150 questions. Did I send this to you, Sydney? I said I was going to. I need to send it to all of you. Um, I'm also the editor-in-chief of that big, heavy, caring for your baby and young child book, the one that weighs, that's a <laughs> oh, giant wow. paperweight that weighs so much it's three inches. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Why? That is truly a dictionary. <laughs> um, Exactly. And then um, I also have, a, this is not an AP book, but What to Feed Your Baby. This is the book that I wrote when I realized why my second child was such a picky eater and that it was all my fault and what parents could do to prevent that. I love it. It's great. I also yes. love the pineapple in the back. I feel, I feel like now we've gotten an uh, intimate view of the. So during COVID, that remember they said that on your Zooms when you were doing like news segments, everybody needed a pineapple. <laughs> I um, wasn't doing enough news segments. Yeah, like, ditto. Oh, <laughs> well, when you have to get up at three in the morning, you know, to do CNN to talk about the new pediatric COVID vaccine, <laughs> yeah. you need, yes, exactly, on the West Coast, because they know that, oh, we need someone at three in the morning who's not doing anything in the middle of the night. Oh, it's a pediatrician from Southern California. Let's call her. And um, so that's when I got the pineapple. Yes. There you go. <laughs> I just tell my patients that the COVID is going to be no, crying if they no. don't take the, the COVID bits. We've, uh, this, you know, we've used the joke enough. This, this was wonderful. This was so great. Dr. John Allman, thank you for, for sharing your time, your expertise with us on the Crip Setters. We're very, very grateful. Wonderful episode. Excited to, to send it out into the world. Uh, uh, thank you again from the bottom of our heart for, for joining us. This was very fun. Thank you for having me. This has been another episode of the Crip Ciders. It's for the kids. Get show notes and sign up for our weekly Knowledge Food Formula Feeds newsletter on our website at www.thecribsiders.com. 
We're committed to providing you with high value practice changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review the show on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. Or you can email us anytime at thecryptsiders at gmail.com. We respond. A special thanks to our producer for this episode, Sydney Angel, our executive producer for this episode, our, and showrunner, Sam Mazer, our wonderful social media team on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you for joining us tonight. I've been Justin Lee Burke. This has been Sydney Angel. And this has been Chris the Chew Man Chew. Thank you. Good night. Hey, you've already listened to the entire episode. Now claim CME credit. Continuing education credit is provided by VCU Healthcare Continuing Education. VCU is accredited to provide continuing education to the entire healthcare team. Check it out at cribsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information and to claim your credit after listening to this episode. And now, for those who have listened all the way to the end, here's your reward. A poem written by AI. In this podcast, dear listeners, hear me well, of sleep and dreams where tiny cherubs dwell. From lullabies to twilight's soft embrace, we guide you through each nightly sleepy chase. Then to food where picky eaters roam, in tiny chairs that make up a mealtime's home. We'll share advice to make your dinner smooth and help you find the veggie-loving grove. To potties next, the throne of toddler's reign, where victory can feel quite a gain. <laughs> With charts and cheers, we make the process fun until the day the potty wars are won. Yet through each trip and every lesson shared, remember parents, nothing quite compared to love the glue in every family's tale, the constant wind that fills each lifelong sail.